Hello, I'm Ted Morrissey, and I'm making a video for the Revisionist Shakespeare class. Uh, this week we read New Boy by Tracy Chevalier, and I wanted to kind of use that as a springboard to uh, this little video discussion. Uh, we've already talked about the book uh, online, you know, via the discussion board and, and the announcements and so forth uh, pretty extensively, so I don't know that I have a whole lot more to say about the book. I think uh, your comments were, you know, very insightful, and and some of you loved the book. A couple of you, not so much. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a little bit on the fence about the book. I I I don't necessarily, you know, rank it way up there on my list of books that have ever been written in the English language, but. Um, I do appreciate um, some of the risk taking that uh, Tracy Chevalier does, and I and I do appreciate how thoroughly she obviously was, um, you know, uh, immersed in uh, Othello because all kinds of, you know, not just major themes but minor sort of details are worked into um, the plot, which I think is very cool. That's fun to to read and encounter, especially if you're familiar with the play. Uh, so there's a lot to admire here about what's going on in the book, even if the book as a whole is not, um, you know, everyone's cup of tea. I think the other two books that we're going to be reading this session, uh, the other two revisionist texts uh, by um, Jeanette Winterson and, uh, and Margaret Atwood, they're more kind of my cup of tea. And maybe, you know, some of you who are not in love with New Boy, maybe you'll you know, find uh, those more to your, your liking. Obviously, we're reading them for technique and, and so forth, not just as kind of a, uh, you know, readerly response to them or whatever. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, though, is, um, you know, some people thought that maybe the book was intended for a really young readership. And I know others said, no, that's not it. And, and I know I kind of had a kind of that vibe the very first time I read the book, um, but obviously it gets into very um, adult kinds of issues in terms of racism and sexism and violence and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, it's not meant for kids. It's, it's an adult book, you know, it just happens to have kids as the main characters, right? And that got me thinking about other books like that. And uh, just off the top of my head, I jotted down some books that I'm familiar with, uh, some of which are, are books I really, really like. Uh, the first one that popped out to me or popped up to me was, of course, kind of the, the great American novel, uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, right? So that's clearly an adult book, but with, um, you know, a, a, a child protagonist. Um, and of course, if we included uh, Tom Sawyer, you know, the adventures of Tom Sawyer, you know, that's a whole kind of gang of, of, of kids, probably a very similar age to the characters in New Boy. Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird, uh, I thought about that one. We've got, um, you know, obviously it's a reflective narrator. So it's Scout all grown up reflecting on her childhood. But yet much of the novel takes place in that time frame. So we're you know, we're looking at Scout as a little girl, her brother Jim, Dill, you know, that whole that whole group. So that certainly, I think, would fit in that category. Uh, Lord of the Flies, you know, about a group of children, uh, you know, who are marooned on an island. You don't have to sort of uh, uh, fend for themselves. Um, a book that is one of my all-time favorites, but yeah, I don't think very many people have heard of it, is um, Russell Hoban's um, speculative science fiction novel, Ridley Walker. It is a great book, but the main character, the title character, Ridley Walker, is a young boy. Um, he's also the first-person narrator of the book, but it is a terrific, terrific book. Um, so if you like speculative fiction, uh, or if you just like great books, I would definitely encourage you to uh, read Ridley Walker by uh, Russell Hoban, who's really known more as a children's author. But this is definitely an adult book, even though it has a child first-person narrator. Um, my own uh, literary idol, William Gass, um, one of his first publications was the novella The Peterson Kid. That's P-E-D-E-R-S-E-N, The Peterson Kid. And the main character there is a, is a young boy. Um, and, uh, and so we, we get uh, the whole novella through his 
kind of warped and childish perspective, but it is a great, great book. It's been, you know, translated into multiple languages. And so I definitely would recommend that. Um, you, in, in the States, you would have to buy it as part of, uh, in the heart of the heart of the country and other stories. Um, it's part of that collection. Uh, some of the translations uh, out there, it's published as a standalone book, but uh, here, that's how you get it. And then, um, oh shoot, I didn't bring a copy with you. Hold that thought. Okay, I'm back. I've got this whole pile of books I'm going to parade in front of you, and but I meant to include this one. This is a, a book I'm just becoming really familiar with, um, Beasts of No Nation, originally published in uh, 2005, but um, very recently it was turned into a Netflix movie, um, uh, Uzo Denma Iwala. I'm sure I'm not saying that quite right, although I did you know, try to listen to some podcasts and so forth um, uh, where his name is pronounced. So I'm sure I'm not doing it quite right, but I, I did give it a good shot. But um, this is a great book. This is um, about um, Agu, a, uh, a, a boy in, in uh, some sort of unidentified African country that is at war and he's, you know, pulled into the conflict. Um, really more of a novella, even though it says novel. It's pretty fast to read, but it's a great book. I'm actually uh, teaching this right now in a humanities course that I'm teaching at a local community college. And um, so anyway, I would definitely include that in the mix of great books with child characters. At least the main character is a child. His friend is a child, but otherwise most of the other characters in the book are adults that they're dealing with. So, so there are a few um, possibilities of you know, adult books that have um, children as the main characters. Um, and if you Google that, um, you know, that basically that search, you know, criteria, you'll find several different sites that give you even more lists of books that have uh, child characters. And I, like I said, I mainly wanted to talk about the ones that I just am personally familiar with and just kind of just popped into my own head. Um, but, uh, I think it's worth thinking about um, as writers that um, we certainly can write adult fiction that um, is focused on child characters, even um, you know, even as first-person narrators, right? And uh, I I write about younger characters quite a bit. They usually are more mid to upper teenagers, in other words, kind of high school age-ish. Um, and I suppose that's because I spent 38 years of my life uh, spending more time with people that age than, than anyone else. So I was kind of uh, absorbed into their psyches or something. Uh, but, um, but sometimes I write about somewhat younger characters. And of course, sometimes I write about you know, adult and much older characters, you know, I'm, just, I'm kind of all over the, the bandwidth there in terms of age. But, um, but again, I, do ha I have written quite a bit about uh, teenage characters. And in my current book that I'm working on, a couple of the main characters are younger than that. They're more like 12-ish, you know. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's certainly something you can do. And um, it's something to worth think, you know, to think about if you have it. So, um, one of the things, though, I did want to clarify, um, you know, the the books we're reading, the, the revisionist books we're reading this session are of a little bit special variety. As you know, um, the idea was that the publisher, um, Hogarth, uh, specifically um, commissioned, you know, these contemporary authors to write revisionist books based on specific, you know, assigned plays, I suppose. I don't quite know how the process worked, but basically a writer would agree to write a revisionist text of Othello in this case, or whatever it might be. And so the books that we're reading, they try to take basically the entire plot of the original, the original Shakespeare play, and sort of turn it into something else, right? Different time period, different kinds of characters, and so forth. And that certainly is um, one way of doing revisionist work, but it doesn't have to be. And in fact, I, I would say in the majority of the time, that isn't quite how revisionist uh, you know, works of literature come to be. I think oftentimes they are 
prequels to you know a well-known text or they are sequels to a well-known text or they take a, a minor character in, in the original and kind of flesh out their perspective somehow or another. Um, there's no particular way of doing it, but for those of you who are not familiar with the, I guess I'll call it a genre of revisionist fiction, I don't want you to come away from this class with the impression this is the only way you can do revisionist fiction, is to take the original, whatever it is, whether it's a Shakespeare play or some classic novel or whatever, and sort of redo it completely in your own, you know, sort of, context or whatever. There are lots of other ways of doing revisionist work besides that. Um, as you may know, um, I teach um, another revisionist course here for Lindenwood, but that's more of a, a sort of broader lens in terms of looking at uh, different kinds of revisionist fiction, uh, whereas this one is very you know, kind of laser focused on Shakespeare and, and specifically those books that were commissioned to be written about specific plays. Uh, my other revisionist course, which actually I've been teaching longer, um, has, a, again, a wider scope, but, you know, it's still a pretty brief course, so we can't get into nearly as many texts as I would like. Um, but um, I just want to share some of those with you just to, again, kind of give you a, a different perspective on what could be done in case this is a brand new area for you. Uh, and plus it also may, you know, inspire your own creativity or whatever. Um, so the other revisionist course, when I first started teaching it, uh, we had longer sessions here at Lindenwood. And so we were able to do more material. Um, then we, you know, uh, shrunk the courses to eight weeks. Um, and so that, you know, precipitated my having to cut some material from that course. And I really hated to do it, but the, the material that I ended up cutting the last couple of times I taught the class was um, using this, in the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde as the original text. And then this, which a book I just absolutely love, is Mary Riley by Valerie Martin. And this is a really interesting revisionist work um, because it's it's really more about the main character, Mary Riley, who is a maid in the household of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, of course. Um, and that story, the original story, um, you know, by Robert Louis Stevenson, it sort of takes place in the background of the novel. I mean, occasionally... Mary Riley interacts with either Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde. Um, and if you're familiar with the original, you can see that the basic chronology of the novella, you know, is followed. But really the focus is on Mary Riley and her own sort of troubles. You know, she's got her own her own problems happening, you know, within within the household and within her life uh, that are kind of separate and apart from what's going on yeah. with uh with, uh, you know, Dr. Jekyll. So again, really interesting treatment. So it is revisionist because clearly it uses the original as a kind of framework. And like I said, she does interact with those main characters and, and other minor characters that are mentioned in the original come into play a little bit here and there, but the main focus is on a wholly made up persona. I mean, there are maids mentioned, you know, servants mentioned in the original novella, of course, uh, but none is named Mary Riley and there's no specific focus on one. So what Valerie Martin has done is taken that type of a character and really fleshed, fleshed her out into her own you know, protagonist. But really, really interesting. But unfortunately, like I said, the last couple of times I've taught that class, I haven't um, used uh, Jekyll and Hyde. What I have done, though, um, pretty consistently, sorry, I'm trying to make sure I get all the right books here. Um, Another, you know, one of my books I'm really impassioned about is uh, the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf. Um, I've actually, you know, written a scholarly book about it that's been, that was well received and won an award. Um, and, um, you know, I've, I've published some articles about Beowulf and I've actually translated some of it. Uh, my one translation was published last year and I'm really interested in, in maybe doing an entire translation of the book, but, uh, you know, that would be a whole nother ball of wax. But anyway, I'm very interested in the poem Beowulf, and there's been lots of revisionist work done on this Anglo-Saxon poem, which you may remember from high school or undergrad years, maybe read an excerpt or, or something like that. But as you know, it's about uh, 
the warrior Beowulf who comes to Denmark uh, to try to rid King Hrothgar of the monster Grendel. And then things kind of, you know, go from bad to worse in, in some regards. But that's the original poem. Um, we read um, a couple of different treatments of, of that in this other course. One is uh, the novelist John Gardner's novel Grendel, who uh, is, you know, the first monster that uh, Beowulf has to deal with. And uh, so it tells the story of Beowulf, but from the monster's perspective, really great stuff. Um, you know, funny, engaging. Again, if you know the original poem, you see all sorts of ways that Gardner brings that into the, the plot, but at the same time, you don't really need to have a familiarity with the original to really enjoy this book. Then um, another uh, revisionist work that we look at in association with Beowulf is uh, Susan Sig Morrison's Grendel's Mother, The Saga of the Weird Wife. And uh, again, if you're familiar with the poem, you know that one of the other monsters that Beowulf has to uh, fight is not just Grendel, but Grendel's mother. And um, so this is a revisionist work looking at um, Grendel's mother as the main focus. But it, it's interesting because what uh, Morrison has done is, is kind of come at it from, you know, all myths must have been based in, you know, real you know, history. And then over time, things were blown out of, you know, proportion and, and you know, romanticized or, or whatever it might be. And so she tries to create a tale about real people that over time might have been, you know, kind of expanded and elaborated and mythologized into the poem we know as Grendel. So a really interesting revisionist project. I think she does a really good job of it. I don't have it here, I'd have to stop the video and go grab it when I, when I won't do that again. But um, another really great uh, revisionist work on Grendel that I love is uh, Michael Crichton's novel, Eaters of the Dead. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may know, you know Michael Crichton better because of Jurassic Park and things like that. But, but one of his first novels it came out in the 70s was this novel, Eaters of the Dead. And in the introduction, he explains that uh, he and a, another writerly friend of his got in a, in a disagreement because this friend of his said Beowulf was really boring. And the only reason people read it is because, you know, professors and teachers make people read it. And Michael Crichton was like, no way, it's a great story. It's just, you know, the language is a little out of date and so forth. And so he sat down to try to write a, a sort of page turning version of of Beowulf, and uh, and it came out to be this novel, Eaters of the Dead. It was eventually, many years later, made into a movie uh, starring Antonio Banderas um, and, and retitled The Thirteenth Warrior, um, but uh, also a great movie, um, a great movie version of uh, Eaters of the Dead, and then uh, another you know, really interesting retelling of the original story of Beowulf. Right, so so those are uh, the books we read uh, among the books we read in the other revisionist uh, class, but um, we we finish that with um, looking at the New Testament, uh, or at least parts of it, uh, particularly about uh, Jesus's uh, crucifixion. That's kind of where we focus um, in the New Testament, and then we look at um, some revisionist work. We read um, uh, Par Lagertvist's um, novel Barabbas, which is about uh, the thief that was going to be crucified along with uh, Christ and, and, and wasn't. And so this is um, his story, what happens after he's released and so on. Really great stuff here. Um, and then uh, another really interesting revisionist work with the New Testament kind of in the background is uh, the Irish writer uh, Colm Toibin's The Testament of Mary. Very uh, slim. I mean, it's more of a novella than a novel, but uh, a great book, um, the basic plot of which is uh, after Jesus's death, um, the original gospel writers are starting to kind of create the story of Christ as, as deity, and they want to interview Mary um, and kind of get her perspective and, and weave her story into this, this narrative about Jesus as, as, as 
as God, and she's not having it, basically. You know, to her, you know, she had to watch her son being brutally tortured and, and killed, and she has no interest in trying to deify her son. And so it's this sort of, uh, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, for, you know, friction between her and the early gospel writers and so forth. So a really interesting text, but again, a great revisionist work. Um, very, very, you know, different from, um, you know, a lot of things you might encounter. Now, uh, a couple of others that I'll mention here, um, you know, I'm, I'm simultaneously teaching a course in um, the long story and the novella, and um I've brought in a couple of revisionist works for that class. Um, again, one, I, I know I say it, one of my favorites about every book I hold up, but it's true. Um, Wide Sargasso Sea by Gene Reese. And this is a prequel, yes, prequel to Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Um, so we are introduced to a young Edward Rochester who has just married um, his his wife, um, you know, Bertha, and uh, kind of get that backstory. You know, what, what was that all about? Uh, if you're familiar with, um, with Jane Eyre, you know, that did not turn out so well at first marriage. Um, so uh, this kind of uh, tries to tell that story from, from a, uh, you know, pre- you know, uh, chronological point to Jane Eyre. So really good stuff. Again, more of a novella than a, than a full-blown novel. And then another book that we're reading in my long story and novella course is Toni Morrison's Home. And I love Toni Morrison. Um, just a great, great writer. Uh, used to teach uh, her her material quite a lot, especially her novel Beloved. But I, I work this, uh, again, kind of brief novel, short novel, into uh, my long story novella course. And this is a, um, a revision of Homer's Odyssey, and I think a little bit of the Iliad thrown in there as well. Not obviously so. Um, you know, you have to have some familiar some familiarity with, um, with Homer's uh, text to begin with, the Odyssey. Um, but, um, but if you do, you'll see how it, it definitely draws on that and it is inspired by that. So this is Toni Morrison's uh, short novel, Home. Really good stuff. So as you know, hold on, I'm going to pause again. Okay, I'm back. So as you know, I'm very interested in, in revisionist fiction, not only as a teacher, but as a writer myself. Not everything I write is revisionist, but a lot of that I a lot that I've written has been a revisionist. I really enjoy working in that mode. So I was just going to share a little bit of uh, my own revisionist work with you, again, mainly to talk about other kinds of options besides the sorts of books that we're actually reading in this course. Uh, my very first novel was uh, Men of Winter, and um, this is a sequel of sorts to Homer's Odyssey. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not super obvious. For one thing, it's set in early 20th century Siberia. Um, and, uh, you know, you really have to have a familiarity with the original to see, you know, how, how, how that is sort of um, affecting the text. But you don't have to have any knowledge of Homer's Odyssey to, to you know, hopefully, you know, understand and enjoy the novel. But this is a, 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 a sequel to a Homer's Odyssey. Um, another of my early books, again, a novella, actually called a novella, is um, Weeping with an Ancient God. And in this um, book, I looked at the author Herman Melville, uh, who you probably know if you know him at all because of the novel Moby Dick, although obviously known for other things too. Bartleby the Scrivener is one of his short stories that's often anthologized. So maybe you came across Bartleby in some undergraduate anthology or something like that. But uh, Melville, when he was a young man, um, joined a, a whaling ship and uh, went on this uh, really um, adventurous, you know, like a two-year uh, journey, you know, roughly two years. And, uh, and part of the time he was uh, kind of stranded on this island in the, in the Marquesas, the Marquesas Islands, and ended up uh, living for a time with a, uh, a 
a group of, of uh, indigenous people who were practicing cannibals. And uh, when he finally returned to the U.S., he wrote his own um, kind of fictionalized account of it in the novel Taipei. So what I did in Weeping with an Ancient God is sort of um, I sort of used Taipei, but also his his biography um, and his own you know. Uh, you know, non-fictional references to his experiences and kind of weave all that together into a, a, my own sort of fictionalized rendition of his time on the island among the practitioner practitioners of cannibalism. And um, so that ended up being the novella Weeping with an Ancient God. Um, another revisionist work that I... Uh, published is my novel Untimely Frost. And this is a little bit different uh, in the sense that it's not directly revisionist. And what I mean by that is um, there was a, uh, there's always been this kind of uh, uh, rumor, it's not quite the right word, but um, belief that when, when Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, was widowed, she had some romantic interest in the American author Washington Irving, who we know best for the Headless Horseman, you know, and Sleepy Hollow, and and uh, and things like that, and uh, they did have some interaction when he was in London, um, but no actual romantic relationship came of it, as far as we know. But I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if there had been? So I've written this novel where I have a Mary Shelley-like character and a Washington Irving-like character um, who meet and do have this <clears throat> affinity for one another and this romantic relationship. And so I do draw from both of their biographies, you know, Mary Shelley's and Washington Irving's and their bibliographies and bring in, you know, things they've written or were writing and, and so forth. But I really play fast and loose with the details because I'm not trying to specifically retell the story of Mary Shelley and Washington Irving because this didn't actually happen. But um, it, to me, it's revisionist because it is drawing so much from those actual authors' lives and their, and their works, right? So an untimely frost. And then much more recently, um, my novel, Mrs. Seville. Uh, speaking of Mary Shelley, um, as if you are familiar with her novel Frankenstein, you know that it is an epistolary novel uh, told from the perspective of a gentleman named Robert Walton. And it's all basically one long letter to his sister, Margaret Seville, who is uh, in London uh, while he is uh, exploring the Arctic. And um, even though the whole book essentially is addressed to her, we know almost nothing about her. So I decided a few years ago that I'd like to sort of flesh out her story, who is Margaret Seville and what, what's going on with her. And so I wrote um, Mrs. Seville. And this is, in, in essence, a, a sequel to Frankenstein, although, you know, not, um, it doesn't take up exactly where Frankenstein left off, but is sometimes later and makes use of... Uh, you know, some of the characters that we're introduced to in Frankenstein, including Mary Shelley herself. Um, but anyway, this came out in 2018. It's done pretty well for itself, but I really enjoyed really enjoyed writing it. So I'll stop there because I've been going on for a while. But again, my main, my main point here is that while what the authors are doing that we're looking at this semester uh, is a way that you can do revisionist work. You can take a whole work and kind of tell it via a different lens, put it in a different context. But there are lots of other ways to, to be inspired by, by classic um, works, prequels, sequels, using them as kind of a background text, um, using them for inspiration, but not necessarily following them that, that closely. I mean, really, you know, there's no limit. As long as you're somehow drawing from the original for your inspiration, for your creativity, I think it qualifies as a revisionist work. Not that it has to be revisionist. It's just a work of fiction or whatever, right? So um, I'd be curious, um, maybe if you talked a little bit about uh, some books that you know, either that have um, child characters, but yet are definitely written for adults, or, um, you know, revisionist works that you're familiar with, or maybe things you're already starting to, you know, be inspired to possibly write about, right? So I look forward to your comments, and I will see you down the road.